Um, so before lunch, we um, answered the first question about the volcano plot. Which gene has the smallest adjusted p-value and passes our long twofold change cutoff? And so we went over how in volcano plots um, we're plotting the we always plot the negative log of the p-value or adjusted p-value, which means that the y-axis is actually flipped um, in in respect to how we think of p-value. So we think of p-value is very small is good. Well, when you take the negative log, very big is good. So when I say which gene has the smallest adjusted p-value and passes a log two-fold change cutoff, I look for the gene that has the highest negative log p-value, adjusted p-value, which is GM5532. So now, next question um, for answering on Mentimeter is um, taking a look at this gene, GM5532, is it more highly expressed in the flight or the ground control samples, and how do you know? So just a reminder, what we're looking at in this plot is the comparison of flight versus ground control. So any the log two-fold change values are calculated by comparing flight on the top versus ground control on the bottom. So going back, um, this is something that I went over in the lecture for um, when you calculate log two-fold change. The, the signage of it, uh, given whatever ratio you're comparing. So, um, is GM5532 more highly expressed in flight or ground control samples? And All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the voting. So, um, take a peek here. Um, we've got a few different answers. So GC, all changes negative in compared to flight versus GC. Flight, more highly expressed in GC with a contrast of flight versus GC and negative log two-fold change. That means expression is lower in flight as compared to GC. Flight samples, more highly expressed as has a lower log two-fold change value. GC, X versus Y gives positive value for X. Increased abundance higher in GC, log two equals negative one, i.e. two-fold less in flight. Okay, so let's go through this together. Um, let me, so first let me point out, right, so if we look at this plot, um, you can see that GM5532 has a negative log two-fold change in the flight versus ground control comparison. So if we go back and take a look at how we calculate log full change, um, that's the, um, the, to calculate full change, you just take the ratio between the two groups. And um, recall, we, we noted that this is just going to be values between zero and one with uh, closer to one, meaning the groups are more similar and closer to zero, the groups are, are farther apart. But to make this a more intuitive comparison, we take the log of those values so that um, the, a negative log full change will indicate lower overall values in the group being compared on top, whereas a positive log full change indicates higher overall values in the group being compared. So in our case, we have the two groups being compared are flight versus ground control. So a negative log full change, which is what we have for this gene, indicates lower overall values in the group being compared, which is the flight group. So we were doing flight versus ground control. So the question is, is this gene more highly expressed in flight or ground control samples? We can say this gene is more highly expressed in ground control samples because it has a negative log full change, meaning it's higher in the um, it's lower in the group being compared, flight, which means it must be higher in ground control. Are there any questions about this? Would you like me to go over this again? Is this clear to everybody? Excellent. All right. Okay, so keeping with this theme of figuring out genes that are with whether they're 
expression is higher in one group or another, which gene, taking a look at this plot, is most highly differentially expressed in the flight group? And does this gene also pass the adjusted p-value cutoff? So we just went over how log full change can help us figure out whether a gene is differentially expressed in one group or another, the sign of, of log two full change. So which gene is most highly differentially expressed in the flight group? And does this gene also pass the adjusted p-value cutoff? All right, great. Stop the loading now. Um, okay, so I get a lot of KRT17, one Wnt9b, 32, and a dot. Okay, very good. So um, we just talked about how um, calculating, when we calculate log fold change, we take the log of the ratio of the comparison, right? So in our case, our comparison is flight versus ground control. And we can tell by the sign of log full change um, whether a result is has a higher value um, in the group being compared, which in our case is flight, so the numerator. So a negative log full change indicates lower values in the group being compared. A positive log full change indicates higher values in the group being compared. So um, higher uh, than the, the group that it's being compared against, I mean. So here, um, the, if we take a look at our log two full change, we know that anything to the right of zero, so anything positive, means a higher expression, the gene is higher expressed in flight. Anything to the left of zero, so negative log full change, means higher expression in ground control. So taking a look at the positive uh, portion of the plot, we have one gene that's way out here in right field, which means that it has the highest expression um, in the comparison between flight and ground control. It has the highest overall expression in flight, um, uh, even compared to the other genes, which are more highly expressed in flight than ground control, but uh, KRT17 is very highly expressed in flight. It has a very um, high positive log two-fold change value. And in terms of whether this gene also passes the adjusted p-value cutoff, well, we know that we've set up these thresholds here um, where the vertical thresholds are our log full change thresholds and the horizontal threshold is the adjusted p-value threshold. So anything above this um, horizontal line does pass the adjusted p-value threshold. It, um, and we can also tell that by looking at the legend here. So green is anything that just passed log two full change cutoff. Blue is anything that just passed adjusted p-value cutoff, so that's within those two lines. And red is anything that passed both the adjusted p-value and the log two full change cutoff. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this? Especially, um, there are a couple of answers that were a little bit different. I want to make sure that everyone, sorry, the wind slammed my door. Hope you couldn't hear that. Um, anyone who this maybe wasn't clear for at the beginning, please shout out. I can go over this again. More than happy to review. Uh, hey, Lauren. I had actually forgotten that the horizontal line was for the um, adjusted p-value. I was... Uh, awesome. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I got the KRT17 one, but uh, I thought that the blue was what we wanted it to be in, in for it to, to, pass, to, to pass both, but I, I guess see. it's horizontal. I see. Okay. So is this, make, this is making sense now. The red is like it's past the horizontal and it's past the vertical. So it's past both thresholds. Yeah. 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 I see it. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for unmuting and clarifying that. All right. And so then for, um, I think a couple people might have come in a little bit after. I went over the second question, so I just want to really quickly review it as well. 
So the question was, um, you know, we identified GM5532 as the gene with the smallest adjusted p-value or largest negative log adjusted p-value. Um, and it does pass that log to full change cutoff because it's uh, within the part of the, the plot that's outside the log two full change cutoff thresholds here with the two vertical dotted lines. So the question was, is it more highly expressed in flight or ground control samples? And so this is the same principle here. We know that anything with a negative log full change uh, means that it is um, lower expressed in the group being compared. So here that's flight. So that means it's going to have um, it's going to have a lower expression in ground control. Right. So more highly expressed in the ground control samples. And we know because we can look at the sign of the log to full change value. That plot is so um, straightforward, but I also seem to confuse myself every time I look at it at first. <laughs> it really takes 100% of my concentration to make sure I know what's going on in this plot. There's a, there's a lot going on. It makes you, it makes you think that the blue is like the sweet spot. At least that's how I was thinking about it. Like that's the like, oh, it's okay. right there in the middle, exactly where yeah. you want it to be. But it's the red is what you want to apparently is what you want to look for because it passes both of those criteria. And usually like the far off ones are the one that you want. Usually it's the middle, but that's what that's what got me. Uh. I do have a blue color bias. I like <laughs> blue. It's my favorite color. <laughs> well, it's the best. It should be. <laughs> Yeah, good point. So maybe if I were to explain this again, I would really emphasize like we're looking at the outer edges of the plot because we've set up thresholds where you have to be outside or past those thresholds to to pass like to win, you know, to be significant. It's a good point. Thank you. Will extreme data like KRT-17 require verification for publication? Um, I, you mean like uh, an additional lab study to, yeah, depend, yeah, so it, it depends on the kind of paper you're trying to publish. So if you're trying to publish a paper that's just bioinformatics analysis and you say, we did RNA sequencing, we did such and such a QC, and filtering, and this is what the data say, you know, take it or leave it. We're not saying that this is necessarily going to happen again in another experiment, because we haven't done another experiment, but this is what we saw in our analysis. That's one type of study, and it goes to a specific type of journal with a specific type of reviewer, as Amanda said. But yeah, it is. it does strengthen bioinformatic results if you can then do an additional lab study for verification, for sure. Yeah, and like if this was the early 2000s, you can get away in a high level journal just doing an RNA seq study and getting away with this. But nowadays, if you want a higher impact journal, if you're making any statements about what genes are differentially expressed based on RNA seq data, they're going to want to see some additional analyses to verify that. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, um, Speaking of, you know, like if, if we were investigating, we were analyzing this data set, we were, we, and we were trying to come up with um, results and maybe a hypothesis to test in a lab, the next thing to do um, would be to kind of look at these um, genes that have a high expression or in one group or the other. And so since we were looking at GM5532 as being most um, it has the most significant p-value out of any of these genes, adjusted p-value out of any of these genes. Let's see if we can find its biological function. So um, I usually start by Googling this. Uh, so go ahead and see if you can find an annotated function for GM5532 and let me know in the Mentimeter. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and show the answers now. So I get, yeah, type of non 
coding RNA gene, can't find specific names, link RNA, non-coding RNA with biased expression heart and adrenals, uncharacterized protein, no annotated function, doesn't have, yeah. So this gene, um, it doesn't really have an annotated function. You can take a look at um, where it tends to be expressed and so someone noted that here on NCBI, but yeah, there doesn't really seem to be much of an annotated function for this gene. Um, so sometimes this happens in RNA sequencing data. We, there's a gene where we know it's, it's a gene, but it's annotated, but it doesn't have a function. So um, sometimes you could say, you know, if we were if we were studying this data set, we could say this is potentially, you know, we might have discovered a, a gene that plays this novel role where it's downregulated in flight, and maybe you know we could help annotate the function if we had a lab and we were interested in studying this gene. Um, all right. So finally, going back to KRT seventeen. Um, where we we already noted that it this is the gene most highly differentially exp expressed um, in the flight flight group based on its very very high positive log two fold change value. So what's the function of this gene? And um, based on its function, does that make sense in terms of which group it's more highly expressed in? more seconds so everyone can finish their answers. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. There are some great hypotheses here. So, right, so KRT17, yes, this is a keratin gene. It is increased in the flight samples. We already noticed that. Um, one idea is this could be skin cell contamination from a lab tech. Um, another idea is um, this gene is associated with stress and DNA damage response. And um, someone else noticed this gene is um, involved in regulating cellular pro proliferation, growth, and apoptosis may have to do with radiation exposure in flight higher chance of tumor formation and um, cellular stress. Um, cytoskeleton protein, right? So we're looking at muscle cells. So this is this makes sense. Um, and this gene also is known to regulate protein synthesis and epithelial cell growth. So it might have to do with the lower gravity in, in flight due to disrupted epithelial integrity. So yeah, so these are all just fantastic um, hypotheses. Another, um, it, when Amanda and I were looking into this gene, we noticed that um, KRT is at least one publication, KRT17 um, is upregulated in hypoxic conditions, so low oxygen, and that there's lower oxygen also, you know, in addition to increased radiation and lower gravity, there's also lower um, oxygen on the International Space Space Station, so the flight samples were incubated in a slightly hypoxic environment. Um, so that could be another reason why KRT-17 is seems to be upregulated in flight compared to ground control. All right. So that brings us uh, to our very last challenge here. Um, we made this volcano plot using the default cutoffs. So go ahead and recreate this plot. Um, in the give the empty color blocks here, and um, you can play around with the values that you provide for the adjusted p-value cutoff and the fold change cutoff, and see how this plot changes. So once you have a plot that you are that you like, you're happy with, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and share that code in the chat so we can all see it. In the chat, you said? Yes, in the chat, please. Thank you, everyone.
Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Let's take a look here. So Mark's plot, we have P value cut off of even smaller than what we did with the default. So 10 to the negative seven and a full change cut off um, also more stringent of three. And um, all right, let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like. So here um, we have a lumble blue. Um, there are, we've now made it so there are very few genes that actually pass uh, both thresholds, okay, both the adjusted p value cut off in the horizontal line and the two vertical lines. So, for example, GM5532 now no longer passes the threshold, so it doesn't get a label because only, um, only some of the genes that pass the threshold get labeled. Anyone else want to share their code? <clears throat> oh, thank you, Ty. All right, let's let's take a look here. So here in Ty's plot, we have a, a slightly less stringent p-value cutoff and a more stringent uh, fold change cutoff. So the fold change. Um, bar is higher and um, the p-value uh, cut off um, is um, a little bit lower. So we're still eliminating, a, we have, uh, we're eliminating a bunch of genes because they don't pass the full change cut off. So I want to see what happens if we make a volcano plot using the original um, the original cutoffs where we found 773 differentially expressed genes. So there we had a p-value cutoff of 0 0.05 and a full change cutoff absolute value of 1. So if we take a look at this plot, and I'll put that in the chat. So here, um, as expected, lots of genes pass the cutoff. So there's a lot of red on this plot because it's a much less stringent p-value cutoff um, than the default or any of these other ones. So, yeah. Anybody else? Any questions about volcano plots? or differential gene expression analysis in general. All right, great. Great job, everyone. So this brings us to the end of our DGE notebook. Um, you can go ahead and save it by going to File, Save and Export Notebook As, and select HTML and that'll save this notebook somewhere on your local computer. Does the program provide counts and a table to get those gene data? So we wrote out the counts from this notebook, yeah, um, and we saved those as a CSV file. So the program, if, if, if you mean like the, the gene lab, differential gene expression analysis script, which has been put into this notebook, it does, um, it does save the counts out to a, to a file. Uh, so first of all, we saved our differential uh, DGE table as a differential expression CSV. So that does have the counts, the normalized counts in it. Um, and then we also saved uh, the normalized counts up here somewhere. Uh, Laura, <clears throat> I was just yeah. curious, um, do they extract the data that, that shows significant differentially expressed gene that pass our cutoff? I see. We did not 
do that explicitly, no, that's a good point. So um, we could, um, if we if we were interested, we could use the write.csv file. We could write out um, this um, DG uh, differential gene expression matrix that we made. Um, so maybe let me just go ahead and write uh, some code to do that. Actually, that's a really good point. Why don't we Why don't we all do that? So, I remember where I was. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. So remember, we took our full DG out table, and then we create we uh, did a bunch of filtering. We got a DG out table that only has significant genes, and then we used those gene names to filter our, our um, normalized expression table. So this, this table has only the 773 significant genes and 12 samples. So we can write out this, um, this variable x underscore dge. So we use our write.csv function. The first argument we pass is the variable holding the data that we want to write out. And then the second argument we provide is the path um, to that, that output uh, folder and the name of the file. So I'm going to call this um, DGE Okay, so I tried to give this relatively descriptive name. So differential, uh, differentially expressed genes, and then I put the two cutoffs because, as you can see, we can use whatever cutoff we want, and it's not guaranteed each time. Um, so I said adjusted p-value of uh, 0.05, LFC one, and then I noted that th this is normalized uh, expression data, and then we don't. Um, Row names equals false here. This is a perfect example of every time I write something out of R, I look at the file I wrote out in the command line and then fix the right. arguments in R to work how they're supposed to work. <laughs> All right, let me do that. So, should be row names equals false because the first row should have ensemble as a column header. Yeah, okay. Um, let's just confirm that we're happy with how the file looks. So I've gone to the terminal and I wrote out that file to the DG output folder. So I went back up to where we set up our directory path variables and I found the path to that folder, copied it, and went to the terminal, and I said cd um, into that, that folder, and then I did ls, and here is the CSV file that we just wrote out, and so I can just use head, take a quick look at it, and it uh, looks fine to me. So I have my sample names, and then... Um, Did you say the first row was supposed to be yeah, the ID? Yeah, sorry. Thing? It looks like at this, at this point we got rid of those. Thank you, yeah. So I think that's what, row, that's what I was trying to remember, if that's what row names equals false does. Oh. Okay, so they are stored at row names at this point, as row names at this point then. So we have to say row names equals true, I guess. Okay. All right, so now we have the appropriate row names. Thank you. I missed that at first up here. Okay, so the here's the code that we just put together to write out those differentially expressed genes as a matrix. Any questions about this? Or is any of this uh, not clear? Lauren, do you want to go over how to navigate to that location on the left side panel? 
um, and then how they can download those files if they want to. Mm. Locally. So they all made right. The Great point. Folder. Yeah. So this DG output folder, remember that's a that's a variable we set up, it, and it it's it directs to your home directory. Um, and then the GLDS 104 folder that we created um, and a subfolder called 05 DC2 underscore DG. So on the left hand side here in the file tree, I can double click on the GLDS 104 folder. I think I can anyway. Yeah, you should be able to. Nothing is happening. Maybe you need to go over the actual folder name. Hmm. Let me refresh the page. Try this again. So DGE output is in GLDS 104. There we go. It was just stuck. So I, I was in my home directory on the file tree. I went into GLDS 104 and then I can go into 05 DSeq to DGE and um, I can look at uh, all of these. These are all the files that we wrote out from this notebook. And you can download them locally by right clicking and just clicking on download. Yeah, also all the plots that you made are in that DG plots subdirectory and wrote them out to mm -hmm. there. And then mm -hmm. uh, if you go up to the 04 directory, that's where just the table with just normalized counts are for the sample. Okay, we did not actually write, write out. out. That's right, we didn't write out just normalized counts. We only wrote out the final DGE table. Mm -hmm. So if you want the DGE table, that's in 05. Um, DSeq2 DGE, so that's this differential expression file. What happens if I double click on this? Ooh, looks like I might be able to open it up and view it. Um, I don't know though, does it show over 20,000 genes? <laughs> it's over 20,000 rows. It might take a while to open. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Look at that. That's nice. Okay. So, yeah, you can just see that this is the DG table that we generated, and that there are the normalized counts there in the middle. All right. Any other questions about outputs, how to download them and save them from this notebook? Do you see, Lauren? I'm just curious if you can go into the plots folder. If you could, if they'll open up the plots in Jupiter. I've never tried that. It's stuck again. <laughs> can you, Amanda? Can you open up plots? I can. It's large. <laughs> I share my screen. Do you want to share? Yeah. Can you guys see my screen? So I just went into um, on the right side here. Oh, wow. The 05 directory went into DGE plots and I just tried opening up the uh, volcano plot. So I double clicked on it. It's really big. <laughs> when you open it up in Jupiter. But that's it. PCA plot's big too. Probably change the size in the command to save it, I bet. Mm -hmm. PDF with a heat map. That looks nice. Yeah. So 
sharing. All right, so um, I have managed to lose my schedule in the million windows that I have open, but I believe that we are on track. And the next thing is to do a debrief for the DGE notebook and the stats lecture. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So the rest of the time before break, and then we're uh, can definitely go over after break.